Hey, hey, party people, it's Lycona de Chichi, and welcome to the Easy Peasy Guide for Pandemonium Asphodelos, the Fourth Circle Savage, Part 1, or better known as P4S, or Phase 1, the door boss. First, we place our markers like this, which will be critical to handling mechanics throughout the fight. Your party will need clock positions, as well as two groups consisting of a tank healer and two DPS. These groups will want to have left and right spots, as well as top and bottom spots. For us, we just rotate clockwise, so our left group goes to the top and our right group goes to the bottom, boss relative. For clock positions, you must have tanks and healers on the cardinal directions and DPS on the intercardinal directions. This configuration is critical for handling nearly all the mechanics in the fight. First up is Decalation, which is the party-wide AoE. Next, there will be a set of mechanics that I like to call Part 1 and Part 2. In order to understand this mechanic better, let's talk about what happens as a whole, and then we'll talk about each part and how they affect each other. Hillcast Bloodrake, which will put four tethers onto either the tank and healers or the four DPS. At this point, Take note of which group did not get the tethers. This group will be doing the orange tethers in the second part. The people with these red tethers will take damage as they resolve. He'll cast Etheric Clemmies. Clams? He'll give himself a debuff called Roll Call. For Roll Call, the little icon looks like a green and red poison debuff, so for the rest of the guide, I'll refer to Roll Call as Poison. Not only is it easier to remember, but it's also easier to handle this mechanic conceptually as a poison debuff rather than what it's actually called. And as a funny note, the raid community is really calling this debuff that horrible virus that's been going around lately, and YouTube hates videos that talk about that thing, so please stay home and raid safely. He'll then cast a second blood rake in which he'll put four red tethers on either the tanks and healers or the four DPS again. The people who did not get the tethers this time will have to do poison. He'll then cast Director's Baloney, which will put poison on four random party members. This is the time for the people who need to get their poison to go get your debuff off of the folks who are not supposed to have it. By the end of this mechanic, the poison debuff should only be on the tanks and healers or the four DPS. Next, four orange tethers will come out and attach themselves to four random party members. For the folks who are supposed to grab the tethers, run under the boss and pick up your tethers and then carry them to your marker spots. You might have to stay under the boss for a little bit just so all four party members who are supposed to get the tethers can pick them up. Take those tethers to the outside on your markers. For the tanks and healers, it's the cardinals, and for the DPS, it will be on the intercardinals. All the mechanics will go off at the same time, and this completes part one and part two of these sets of mechanics. There are a few things to keep in mind here. Part one is the two sets of red tethers during blood rake, and part two is when you have to either pick up your poison or grab a tether under the boss and take it out. For part one, when the first set of red tethers come out, we tell ourselves who's grabbing tethers. And then when the second red tethers come out, we say who's grabbing poison. The thing to remember is that the tank healer group or the DPS group can do either both poison and tethers, only tethers or only poison, or none. In other words, it's different each time. Who does what in part two is determined by who doesn't get the red tethers in part one. Another few things for this mechanic is that we set a rule for whoever got poison, they would stand still, and for whoever needed poison, would go and get it. This helped prevent people from passing their poison to other folks accidentally. Also, for picking up the tethers in the middle. You kind of have to run around in a circle until all four tethers are picked up. Even if you got your tether, you still have to wait until all four people in the group get their tethers, and then take them out to your markers. If everyone stands on their markers after the tethers and poisons resolve, the explosions from the tethers will not hit anyone else, and you can still hit the boss from max melee. And of course, we'll see a variety of this mechanic again later in the fight. Decalation comes out next, which is the raid-wide AoE. He'll then cast Elegant Evisceration, which is an AoE tank buster that hits twice. You can either choose to tank swap here and have each tank take a hit, or one tank can use their invulnerability and take both hits. And now he'll cast Setting the Scene, where he'll put down all of the floor stuff you've seen before in normal mode, a lightning, which you have to stay out of the middle, a water, which is a knockback from the middle, a poison, which is a spread mechanic, and fire, which is a little bit different this time, where you need to split into your left and right groups for a fire AoE that hits each healer. 
He'll cast Pinex, which will make two of the four floor panels animate. These two panels will cast their abilities one after the other, so you have to handle each mechanic combination properly. What I've noticed from our runs is that the panels usually go off in a certain order. A knockback from the water, then a poison spread or a fire stack, or the lightning panel, which you have to get away from the middle and stand at the edge of the stage to dodge it, and then a spread or a stack. Once the panel explodes with its mechanic, the corresponding panel on the floor also explodes, so you don't want to be standing on it. Whatever mechanics come out, you'll always want to handle them on the panels that are not exploding on the floor. After the first set of panels go off, the second set of panels will begin to animate. At this time, the boss will place four red markers at the edges of the stage in the cardinal directions. At the same time, he'll cast Northerly, Southerly, Easterly, or Westerly Shift. And you guessed it, basically it's North, South, East, and West. For this, you actually have to read what he's casting in order to find out which directional marker at the edge of the stage he's going to jump to. He'll also always jump to the middle first and face north as he's doing this cast. So you can use him as a directional indicator to get your orientation. Take note of which floor panel is activated at this time and do that mechanic first. Either do the knockback from the middle or dodge the lightning coming from the middle while at the same time make your way to the marker on the cardinal depending on which directional shift he's casting. Also, during that cast, either his sword will be glowing or his cape. And if you remember from normal mode, this indicates which attack he'll do when he jumps to the marker on the cardinal. If his sword is glowing, he'll cleave the inside of the stage, so you want to stand on the sides slightly behind the marker. If his cape is glowing, it will be a knockback from that marker, so stand in front and not on the sides. This cape knockback is really far, so you want to get pretty close and always get knocked towards the opposite end of the stage and not towards the sides. So the order in which all of this goes out, handle the panel's mechanic first, either the water knockback or the lightning AoE, then either spread with the poison or stack in your groups with the fire, look at what directional shift he's casting, head towards that marker, handle the cape knockback or sword cleave, then handle the poison spread or fire group stack. Now that you know what everything does, let's take a moment to recap this phase. We'll see this mechanical phase again later in the fight, so when we get to it later in the guide, I'll just go over what happens. It'll showcase what we do for each panel combination, and while the order of mechanics might be different in your runs, how you handle each individual mechanic is exactly the same. And to recap, let's go over this entire phase in real time just so you know how my brain works and what to look out for. They'll change the floor and then he'll cast Pinax. After the cast, we look for the animations. In this case, it's a water knockback from the middle, and we have a poison spread mechanic. So we get into our positions, and we get knocked back here. We spread out. As soon as both of those go off, we head back into the middle. We see that the floor animation is lightning, so we have to dodge away. He's casting westerly shift, so we have to move to the west. His sword is glowing, so we have to move behind the marker as he cleaves the stage. We look at the fire animation, so it's a stack in your party groups. And in this case, we're at the top and the bottom. And there you go. Pull the boss back into the middle and he'll cast Elegant Evisceration, which is the double tank buster. Then the boss will cast Blood Rake and tether to everyone and only three of the panels on the ground. There is one panel that is not tethered, and that panel will be the safe panel to stand on later in the fight. So just remember it for now at this point, and in our case it was the poison panel, but just note it can be different each time for your runs. He'll then cast Setting the Scene, which will put down our floor panels again. Next he'll cast Vengeful Baloney, which will randomly put two tank and two healer debuffs on the DPS and put DPS debuffs on the tanks and healers. These debuffs indicate which orbs you are allowed to get in a few moments. At this time, we get into our orb positions. The boss will cast Elemental Baloney, which will put a magic vulnerability debuff on the party, but you can ignore these for now. It's actually related to the safe panel a little bit later. Blood Rate comes out next, and you'll want to put up plenty of heals and shields for this next part because we're all going to be running around getting those orbs. The boss will then cast Baloney Burst, which will put down eight orbs in a circle near the outside of the stage. These orbs tether to the closest person, and once tethered, they'll put your roll indicator with an X on its head anti-healer, anti-tank, or anti-DPS. So you can't get your own orb. Once you're tethered to the orb, you and a friend will have to pop another party member's orb depending on what debuff you just got. 
For the tanks and healers, it's easy. You guys will always be getting a DPS orb, but for the DPS, you might be getting a healer or a tank orb. The explosions on these orbs are massive, so you don't want to clip your teammates, hence why we pop our first orb on the cardinal directions and then rotate clockwise to pop the orbs on the intercardinal directions. So here's our setup and how we all work it out. First, we get into our orb positions like this. The two tanks will be at north and northeast, the healers will be at west and southwest, while the DPS will take up the rest of the spots from south all the way to northwest. For the tanks and healers, it's easy. Since they always get the DPS debuffs, they'll always get the DPS orbs. The healers can get their first orb on the west and then rotate clockwise to the northwest to get their second orbs. For the tanks, they'll start with the DPS orb at the south and then rotate clockwise to pick up their second orb at the southwest. For the DPS, there's a little bit more adjustment, but it's simple. If you get a tank debuff, you're going to pop the orb at north and then rotate clockwise to get the second tank orb at northwest. If you get a healer debuff, you're first gonna grab the healer orb on the west and then rotate clockwise to take the second healer orb on the southwest. Make sure you pop an orb with your partner and you should make it through this mechanic no problem. After that, remember the safe panel from before, the one that didn't get a tether from Bloodrake? Well, right after you explode all of the orbs, you have to get into that safe panel and take an AoE hit. He'll cast Blood Rake again, which is a party-wide AoE. The next set of mechanics involves towers and has part one and part two. Just like before, let's go over all of it first and then we'll talk about each part. The boss will cast baloney coils in which he'll put down four towers with the anti-roll indicators. It could be either anti-DPS or anti-tanks and healers. Whoever needs to stand in the towers, stand on your markers slightly towards the back, or at max melee. For whoever's not in the towers, you guys are going to be picking up the orange tethers in the middle and take them out to the markers on the cardinals just like you did at the beginning of the fight. Since the towers always appear on the intercardinals, if the DPS are grabbing tethers, we want to rotate one spot clockwise and take our tethers on the cardinal markers. Same for the tanks and healers, if they need to do towers, they just rotate one spot clockwise. Remember who picked up the tethers here, and who stood in the towers. This becomes important for when we do poison and tethers in a little bit. He'll cast etheric clammies, then cast another blood rake. He'll cast baloney coils again and another set of towers will pop up. Take these towers normally and remember who is not standing in the towers. Next he'll cast director's baloney and this is the same as earlier in the fight where the tanks healers and or DPS have to either get the poison or do tethers or do both. Whoever did not stack in the first set of towers are going to be doing the tethers later. Another way to think about it is whoever gets the tethers during the first set of towers, they're getting the tethers later. Whoever is not standing in the second set of towers, they're doing poison later. For example, in our clear run, the tanks and healers stood in these first towers while the DPS picked up the tethers. Therefore, the DPS will need to pick up the tethers. For the second set of towers, since the tanks and healers were not standing in the towers, they were going to pick up the poison. Resolve both these mechanics like you did earlier in the fight and you're good to go. He'll then cast Decolation, which is a party-wide AoE, followed by another Elegant Evisceration, which is the double tank buster. Limit break here when you have LB3. The boss will start casting Setting the Scene again, where he'll change the panels on the floor, and at this point you've seen all the mechanics before, so just handle this phase like you did earlier in the fight. And to give you guys a better understanding of this phase, I'll just talk through what happened and what I look out for to handle these mechanics. He'll cast Pinax, then we'll have two of the panels go off, it's a water knockback, and a fire stack. So we get into our positions. We hit our anti-knockbacks here and stack on our left and right groups. There goes the fire. Lightning then goes off. We look at what he's casting, it's northerly shift. We run to the north, his cape is glowing. So it's going to be a knockback with the lightning. We dodge the lightning, we get knocked back. And now it's a spread. See, as the poison animation is going off, it's a spread, we all spread out. And there we go, we finish it up. After all that mess, he'll then cast Decolation three times, one right after the other. So use all of your remaining mitigation here. After the third Decolation, he'll auto attack three times, and if you got Hesper down to below 50%, congratulations, you'll be granted a cutscene and you've just reached the final phase. This door boss is arguably harder to clear than the main boss for PS4, at least that's what our group found out. But just know, if you have the DPS to clear this door boss, then you have enough DPS to clear phase two. 
which is good news. Also keep in mind that if you're on the second phase and leave the instance at any point, you have to re-clear the door boss. If you're getting close to clearing the door boss, keep an eye on the instance timer. A general rule of thumb is that if you see less than 100 minutes on the duty timer, it's best to reset the instance. That way you give yourself plenty of time to practice on phase two. If you like this guide and it helped you out to get your clear, please give the video a like and subscribe to my channel. I would really appreciate it. I'd like to thank my raid group, our friends on Behemoth, and our raid leader Venom for doing a lot of the research on this fight for us. And especially, I would like to thank you for watching, and I hope that you found this guide helpful. So until next time, go get your clears, and keep on adventuring. Behind, and then spread, but not on the per not on the green. Spread, but not on the green. Oh my goodness. Okay. So I was I was lost. Oh! <laughs> Oh, you orb. have to you have to bait your orb as well. Yeah, still still working on not dying. Oh, my brain. It's okay. I'll just call it out. <laughs> okay. All right, pulling. They no understand. They only hit boss. Groups, 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 healer groups, healer groups, healer groups. Where's my friends? Like run away. You uh, poison, 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 poison. Wait. Whoa! Why is this still coming to me? <laughs> Remember to spread. Diagram. 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 You've been diagrammed. <laughs> and diagrammed. Oh, look oh, what are you sorry. doing? <laughs> I'm killing you, man. Man, I was just yeah. chilling. Like, I was like, spread, and then Lycra just runs at me. I'm like, why do I feel like I'm just fucking sprinting <laughs> back there? She was like, she I was like, it. I was like, oh, cool. Lycra is just going to stand there. I don't for, need to worry about it. For him. some reason, I, I you said you said tiger anti-knockback, and I'm like, I should stack the tiger. Oh, and then, okay. wait a minute. <laughs> Yes. I can't do anything to <laughs>